whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, do you want to start with the name first, or do you want Sure, to? yeah. Okay, so can you s tell me your name and give me a little bit of background as far as your credentials, your title, at home, things like that. Um, my name is uh, Cecilio Raigulupi. Uh, Cecilia is my baptismal name, and my name Raigulupi, named after our chief Raig and his uh, younger brother navigator named Urupi. So they named me after the chief and the navigator of our clan. And yeah. <laughs> a lot to live up to. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you spell that? Um, Raigulupi spells uh, R-A-I-U-K-I-U-L-I-P-I-Y. -I and our clan name is uh, Ramolofar. Uh, Molofar comes from a uh, uh, word, uh, pantanus. You know, pantanus, one tree on, usually grows on the beach and has a lot of roots. So our clan is the main tree and gets a lot of roots. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so to jump right into the question, how did you become a navigator? You can keep asking. I'm just going to make a little adjustment before we get the next response here. How's it look on the camera, Dave? Does this shirt look okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay. That's good. I, I wouldn't notice. Perfect. So how did you become a navigator? Tell me a little bit about that. Okay, I learned navigation from, uh, from my dad. And in our culture, the knowledge of navigation is actually from the woman. It's kept. The women are the masters. The man, they teach the man, they go out and they, maybe they die in the ocean or they lost, they're gonna lose the knowledge. And women, they live on land and the knowledge is there, it's safe. Yeah. So my grandma, my grandma, she's also a master. She just passed away last summer. She's a master navigator also. She's sister to a navigator, Rapangaluga, Rapangalap. That sailed to Japan twice. Yeah. Did did she pass it on to anybody? Uh yeah. A lot of my cousins and sisters. You know. But we usually don't say that the knowledge is with the woman. They said it's man's skills, but actually it's the women are the one keeping it, and we carry it out. <laughs> cool. Um, so in your culture. Community. How are navigators usually selected? Uh, navigators are uh, uh, selected by their their uncles and the masters of their clan. They select the best fishermen, best uh, skilled people in the community. And then they they go and they tell the chief, and then the chief uh, get all the whole community involved in supporting the, that person that's going to become a navigator. As a hunter, and I started learning from when I was a kid. I had my first uh, sailing canoe when I was like 10 years old. Yeah. And would you go out by yourself? Uh, yeah, I used to go out by myself and then go with my cousin Cesario and my other brothers. Yeah. Your mom was pretty proud. <laughs> <laughs> and, um. and in our language, we don't have. Uh, the word for cousin and uh, aunties and uncles. We call our cousins, we say brothers, uh, sisters. And our uncles, we, build them, we call them dad and aunties, mom too. We don't have a word for cousin and uncle and auntie. Cool. cool. So in your mind, um, what traits or qualities are most important to Becoming and being a, a good navigator. Uh, somebody that uh, is have a strong heart, uh, good fisherman, and also understands the weather. 
and respect uh, respect the the whole environment, not just the ocean, but also land, everything in there, and everything in the ocean. Okay, just to be safe, for for the responses, we want to make sure that the response encapsulates the question as well. So just make sure that whatever for our interviews, they uh, somehow integrate the question into the response. So if they just use, you know, if they don't want to put like text with a question on screen, uh, the viewers know what they're what they're, what they're referring to. Okay. Um, so then maybe Cecilio. Um, if you could just repeat a part of it, just, just you know, like if I were to ask you what traits are important, you could say the traits that are important are, if that's, if that's easy enough. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll keep going. So, um, so you talked about, you know, a quality of being respectful, respecting the ocean, respecting the land, um, being able to read weather traits do you think that these qualities are are or can be learned or are they innate uh, yes they can be learned because if you're not uh, if you're not connected with that whole environment then you know there's no connection you cannot you cannot feel you, you know you cannot sense the ocean and you cannot communicate with the nature yeah you, you cannot do it yeah. In your culture, are there what's the the test, quote unquote, or the um, the rite of passage that you or other navigators in your community have to receive before you go from being a navigator in training to a navigator, if there is any? Uh, can can you repeat the question again? Yeah. So. How do you sort of mature from a navigator in training to an actual navigator um, that is not training anymore, if that's even possible? Or are you always training as a navigator and learning? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I, it's a, I think it's a lifetime uh, uh, continuous learning, yeah. And you can become a navigator, go to the post ceremony until you start sailing your canoe, carry out the, the, the message from the chiefs and the community that you gotta go fishing, you go take people to other places, then that's the time that you're, they really call you the title of a navigator. So tell me a little bit about the pole ceremony. Um, when, do you, when do you make pole or become a pole navigator? And um, how, how does that all work? as far as attendance of the ceremonies and things like that? And uh, the post-ceremony, when uh, your family uh, knows that you're ready, because when you, when you uh, receive your po, you're kind of isolated from the community because you have a title, you have a responsibility for the whole island. So they will talk to the chief, and then the chief will blow his cone shell and gather all the people then you, you're gonna be isolated in a men's house, day and night, learning. All the navigators will come there, because the chief will tell all the navigators. The medicine man, the best fisherman, everybody will come in. And they'll bring you food, you, you don't go anywhere, you just shower, eat, and learn, day and night. Continue learning until they know that you're ready. Because there's nothing written, everything has to be here. You have to remember everything, yeah. It it can take uh, can take months or six months when they know you're ready. Then they will tell the chief, okay, he's he's ready for it. Then they'll make the final ceremony, the post ceremony. Yeah. Okay, so switching gears a little bit. Um, there's so many things that need to be done to prepare for a voyage, but. How would you describe a typical preparation for a longer, maybe a deep sea voyage? Uh, for, for me, for preparation for long voyage, I would uh, 
I would check the weather first, look at the stars, the fighting stars, and make sure the weather is going to be good for that voyage, and gather all the supplies, safety stuff, and make sure all my crews they're okay, and set out for the voyage. And what would be the role of um, the women or the children or the Kupunar elders in What's the role of the community as far as preparing? Uh, when you set out for a voyage, the whole community is uh, involved. They'll bring supplies, and also when you, you before you, you go, you have to visit all the older people, the navigators, to get their blessing for that voyage. Yeah. And then when you're out there on the water, that's the final, final. Uh, there's a final ceremony. Yeah, we call it a tiro. So you turn back, you stand, you stand on this blank on the canoe, then the navigator turn back and start talking back to the people for that separation. Yeah. And everybody can hear. You're within. Uh, sometimes they don't hear because you're out there in the water. You know, just talk. Yeah. So, in you know, there's a whole preparation phase and. And crew selection is another very important part of, of ocean, open ocean voyaging and non-celestial navigation and all that stuff. So how would you describe the importance of selecting your crew and training your crew? The importance of uh, selecting the crew is uh, usually the navigator choose to get his uh, close relatives, his relatives to go on the, on the trip, usually the, the families. They do it together. Because when we go out on the canoe, there's a different language that they use on the canoe. It's called uh, Kebisalafan Ayu. It's a different language. So that they can communicate and respect. Because when you're out there, the father is the navigator, the crew are the children, and the canoe is the mom. So you got to respect everybody. And usually, family are the crew. Yeah. You see, the first question. Can you give us an example of what that language difference is on the canoe that you're, you're talking about, or the, the language? Is it, I mean, is it different terms for different items that you would use on land? It's, uh, it's like very respectful way of talking. Yeah, you don't just say, give me this. Yeah, you have to say it in a term that's very respectful, respectful to everybody. So how do you folks learn that? Is it from just fishing together or? Um? Learn that in the, in the men's house. When, when, we're, when we're kids, we have a men's house and we have a woman's house. Okay, when we're kids, the girls are spending time in the, in the men's house learning men's role. And the boys are in the woman's wood, we call wood, learning the woman's role. And then uh, when they're adult, then that's the four girls, when they get their first menstruation, then they separate, they cannot go to the men's house anymore. So when they're growing up, they already have uh, learned the men's role. And also the men, they're, the boys, they're learning from their mom. And you know, I mentioned earlier that the women are the, the keeper of uh, all the skills and knowledge. <laughs> I love it. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so can you explain, can you describe sort of in your own words what you feel and what the experience you have when you're in the middle of the ocean with nothing around you but clouds and horizon and you are the one navigator responsible for your vessel and your yeah, the feeling for me when I feel out there in the open ocean is the uh, the connection with nature. Yeah, you can really you can really sense, you know, what's going to happen, the pattern of the wave, where your canoe is turning. Yeah, it's that connection with nature that I feel it's you know very important, and it's a good you know it's kind of like giving you more energy and power. And 
to you, what is traditional ocean navigation? What does that mean? How would you describe that? Uh, traditional fish, uh, traditional navigation. Uh, for me, it's just part one. It's uh, not just one part of our culture. We have so many things. We have, uh, 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 you know, traditional fishing. We have uh, uh, traditional foretelling the weather. Nav traditional navigation is just part of the whole thing that makes everything work on work on an island. Because if, if there's no more fish, the navigator takes us to another island to harvest fish. So there's more other things, traditional medicine. So everything is kind of work together. So it's part of that, that thing that makes the island complete. OK, so when you're, so you, you kind of talked about that strong connection to the ocean when you're out there. And it's really just you and your mind and your memory and that everybody else is depending on. Tell me a little bit about the animals or the, the different indicators that you utilize when you're out there to, make, to sort of navigate your way to where you want to go. Uh, the animals we use in the ocean indicating our, it can give us uh, indicating our, uh, our sailing routes. You can see butterflies out there in the open ocean. You can see birds that are on land, uh, seaweeds floating breadfruit leaves, uh, taro leaves out there in the ocean, uh, fish, turtles, and it, it, uh, sometimes you see them, because in the navigation we call it, uh, we call it pukov. When, when they talk about pukov, they talk about, they teach you only about all those animals and reefs, not, not uh, including land, not the stars for the land, but the indication of where you are in in your sailing routes. So can you give me an example of you know, a few animals? For example, maybe how, how would you utilize the turtle to help you find your way to a place? OK, um, I have a son. He's uh, two years old. And his name is uh, Rawalipi. Rawalipi is a turtle. It's uh, uh, about 130 miles southeast of Sarawak. If you miss the island, that turtle will show you where you are. Yeah. And it's a male turtle, black shell. So it's yeah. very distinct. Yeah. And what about, um, what about birds? Do you guys use birds as indicators to help you find your way? Yeah, a lot of birds. Use a lot of birds. The Asaf, I don't know the English name for it. Asaf, they're they're the one farther out. And America, that's another smaller bird. They're farther from land. Uh, other birds that you can see them from, when you're closer to the land in the range about 30, 40 miles from land, they're you know the black ones we, we call a gurukak. They're more closer to land. And uh, in the afternoon, you can see them when they're heading. That means they're heading home to rest on the trees. So that's another indicator where the land is. Yeah, the, the important clouds uh, we see in the before the sunrise, about 4.30 to 6 o'clock in the morning, and in the afternoon before sunset. Those are the clouds uh, that are important. In the daytime, there's a cloud shaped like a tree we call ragir. When you see that cloud, that means there's a storm coming your way. Yeah. And there's a cloud that's shaped like a taro leaf. That means it's going to be a little rain in the day. So we look at the clouds and shapes of the clouds we use for telling us something is going to happen. Yeah. So in other, in other Pacific cultures, um, sometimes navigators like Uncle Wong, he was just telling us, we'll, we'll look at the color scheme of clouds. So Even the colors, yeah. We use that too. So how, how would you give me an example of that? OK, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the sunset, if you see red, red clouds, that means there's going to be a rain uh, next day, that night, there's a close rain coming. Yeah. Interesting. 
<laughs> if you see blue and it's clear, then it's going to be good. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it is for your community and culture to for the younger generation to learn and um, gain the knowledge of tradition and tradition? Oh, it is very important. It is very, very important to pass it on. We almost uh, lose all of this when religion came. Because when religion came, uh, they said it's, it's not good. And, you know, luckily our chief said, we have to continue pass it pass it on and you know give teaching the young generations. Yeah. yeah. And have you noticed um, a difference or any or it being a little bit more difficult to to get these young generations interested in this type of stuff? Uh, I don't see it difficult. I think uh, Nowadays, there's more and more young generation wants to learn. Last summer, I had about 400 students, and we have uh, our class, sailing class, every Wednesday now. And they're, they don't want to get off the boat <laughs> on a stay. <laughs> awesome. That's way better than school, yeah. <laughs> um, so, tell me a little bit in your own mind, in your own words. Um, kind of touched on it earlier about navigation just being a part of all the different facets of your culture and your community. Sorry, yeah. oh, let me hold. I'm going to drop another sound blanket. Oh, let's go back to, tell us a little about, a bit about the steps of, of training maybe or being a navigator and the different levels that you graduate to as you mature. The steps uh, to become a navigator uh, we have uh, 12 navigation school, so it depends on uh, which school you you go to. It's we call it IU. That means the master of your canoe, not not school, but I just refer it to as schools. Maybe that's the English term for it. Uh, the steps is you learn the you learn the moon faces first, learn fishing, learn uh, the months. Uh, and then stars, learn the stars, uh, learn uh, the land, yeah, the land, reefs, and uh, the weather. Then you can start start to go out on the canoe and to surf for ages. Yeah. So I went to, I'm already sailing, but I'm not not, not yet went to the post ceremony. And when you go, when you reach the post ceremony. Uh, you have a you have a place in the community, like you cannot go to certain ceremonies, and you cannot you cannot eat different food. You have to have food that's coming also from the chief and other navigators for the blessing, and also when you reach land, you do a ceremony. When you reach one island and sail to another island, you do a ceremony. Yeah, this but when you're not yet a navigator, when you have an uh, received a post ceremony, yet. you can sail, but you cannot. Uh, you cannot do those ceremonies. And also, when you sail, and there's a canoe that with uh, somebody that already received a po, you have to stay on the west side of his canoe. You cannot be on the on the other side, and you have to stay behind. Even though your canoe is fast, you have to always stay behind him and, and for that respect. And also the rope. You have to tie it differently, yeah. And uh, telltale has to ears have to be short. You have to make it shorter. Yeah. So there's a lot of indication. When you sail, you look and you see it. Okay, this guy is. I have to be. This is my position here. So you mentioned that um, po is not the last step of being, a, like the last step in sort of your your life as a navigator, there's another one after that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the last uh, last one they call uh, Muranu. Muranu in English is like, uh, Mur is firewood. So uh, it's like a firewood, a firewood in the middle of the fire. Yeah. So the Muranu, that's uh, 
Murani, that's the last one. Before the Po, and then uh, after Po is uh, the title after Po is Rapinuok. Rapinuok means the bottom of the bottom of the stick. And then one the last one is uh, Murani. Yes, fire. Okay. Word. Okay, so from uh, before you get the Po, and you start sailing, it's called Seragine Remaro. It's still a green green leaf. And then Po ceremony. After Po, do a lot of voyage, voyaging. And it's called uh, uh, Rapinuok. And then after Rapinuok, the last last one is Morandi. That's the maybe PhD or <laughs> the highest, <laughs> highest respect for navigator. Ceremonies that go along with all of those, or just some of them? Uh, the Seragine Remaro, the green leaf, that's, uh, there's no ceremony. Then uh, after that is the Po, there's a lot of ceremony. And Rapinuok means every time, you, every time you're going to do a Po, you have, to, you have to go to these people for their blessing. And then also when you come back from your voyage, you have to bring something to those people. Yeah. Maybe a fish or a pot of taro. Yeah. you think of or do you think there could be some value in learning about value for conservation and cons conservation of species and biodiversity and sort of stewardship of our land rather than just ownership and not taking care of our world and our environment do you think there could be some value in knowing all the traditions and values of navigation for conservation? Uh, yeah, the value of uh, conservation in our traditional navigation is very important because it relates to all the animals and that's part of navigation. Even before you go out in the ocean, there is indication on land from trees and other stuff that, uh, and animals on land so we knew if it's going to be a calm ocean and a good long voyage. Yeah. So conservation is very, very important for traditional navigation. Yeah. And possibly without it, everything that you learn as a navigator could change because of the environment and the things changing around you? Yes, it's, it, it will affect our way of sailing. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, early 80s, you know, we can tell the weather exactly when we look at stars. And then in 90s up to today, you know, we look at the stars and we say it's going to be a good, good weather. Sometimes it doesn't match up. You now we look and say, okay, it's going to be good. Then we go out and all of a sudden a bad weather come. Yeah. So it's kind of different nowadays. Okay, so last question. Um, what, in your opinion, does navigation have to do, if anything, with fishing? If uh, fish fishermen have to learn navigation to find their, find their fishing grounds and also find their way back home. So becoming a f fisherman is important with navigation because you got to learn both yeah, to be out there. Especially in Micronesia, our islands, uh, uh, five miles offshore, you don't see land anymore. Yeah, there's no mountain. So if you follow a school of fish and you turn back, you don't see land, you cannot find your way back. Yeah. So, and also navigation and fishing, we don't just fish on, in one area. So for navigators that knows other best fishing areas, they go miles offshore and go after good fishing spots and then come back. Yeah. So it's very, it's, it's almost like one yeah, fishing and navigation. 
And also when you go out for long voyages, you have to know how to fish, because that's your supply.